So we, we are now building on top of what we know, on top of the uh, closures, uh, callbacks, uh, functional style programming. And then now we are adding another layer, which is asynchronous programming. Um, asynchronous programming is uh, another key point, key you know, pattern of programming in, in JavaScript. Uh, um, which is a bit strange as it's implemented. Uh, it's not real uh, concurrent code. There's not real parallel code like you do in, uh, you know, the operating system courses, stuff like that. Because J JavaScript basically is a single threaded process. So there is no real parallelism inside JavaScript, inside JavaScript programs. A node is a single threaded program. A browser executes uh, the JavaScript in your page in a single thread. It may, it may have different threads for different tabs, but inside one tab, the JavaScript thread is, is unique. So basically, the execution engine in JavaScript is synchronous. So only one instruction at a time may be executing. Only one function at a time may be executing. This will be a problem in the browser when if you have a, a function which is too, small, too slow, it will block the entire page. Even if this function is run in parallel asynchronously, then when it's running, no, nothing else could be running. Okay, but we will deal with this problem when, <laughs> when the time will come. Um, but uh, uh, there is a mechanism where uh, the execution order or functions is not uh, the sequential one. So function will still execute one by one, but not in the order we expect in a different order that will depend on external events, for example. Um, and um, all of this works uh, fundamentally with, with the callbacks. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the basic, the simplest example no, of asynchronous code is a, a timeout. Mm -hmm. We have a method called the uh, function sorry called the set timeout in the javascript library that uh, uh, sets a callback receives a callback this is the callback function okay callback um, to be executed after a given time So when I execute the set time I set time out function, my code goes immediately to the next line. So I execute set time out, semicolon if you want, and then I go, go on executing this code. This callback, but but the internally the the node JS will trigger a timeout. And while I'm still executing other code that does other stuff. The timeout is progressing. And after the two seconds, for example, 2000 milliseconds, this function will be called. See, this is the callback. The only way to call a function asynchronously if, is if that function is a, a callback that may be called later on by who is going to check the time, for example. So I'm setting a callback, but the difference is that this callback is not being called right now. So I'm not sure I'm no, up to before the break, when we passed a callback function to another function, we were sure that the execution of the callback was inside the call of the other function. So maybe called many times, but all within the context of the larger call of the larger function. Now, this is no longer true. I'm sending a callback, and this callback may be executed even after the main function uh, has finished. So we we know that a callback may be executed later because the mechanism of closures already allows that. With a closure, I can call um, a function a property after the, the initial object has been destroyed. The difference here is that I am not the one calling the function. The function is being called automatically by the engine or by whatever uh, happens, by an external event that will decide that the timeout is over and will call this function. 
Okay, so the, the details of how this works are again a bit more complex and we'll see them in the context of the browser when we will have a more understanding of the events that may happen like clicks and my mouse moves and so on that generates events. In Node, there are very few events to handle, so it's not easy to understand the whole picture. So for the moment, we just deal with the uh, asynchronous callbacks like what they are, a callback function that is called in a different time uh, after the, the function is, is, um, is finished, after, after its uh, activation is finished, okay? Uh, but remember that uh, J JavaScript is still a synchronous language. So if uh, this function, this callback function here, has an infinite loop, for example, that never returns, you are blocking the entire program. So even a, a, an asynchronous callback should return, let's say, quickly, or depending on the work that it has to do, because it will it would be executed asynchronously, but not concurrently. Asynchronous means uh, I don't know when, but not concurrently, so we cannot go in parallel with the main program. It will stop the main program, execute the function, and then resume the main program in a way. Hmm? The details of this will be explained in the, in, the, in the event loop when we deal with the browser. And so this happens in Node, this happens also in, uh, in, the, in the browser. If we are not careful, we, a single callback, which is too slow or enters into a loop, uh, we may stop the program as a whole. And we should be aware of, um, of this method of programming because uh, in JavaScript it's very pervasive. And so we, are, we will be triggering asynchronous callbacks that, that uh, themselves will trigger other asynchronous callbacks and so on. Uh, and we'll have very long chains uh, of asynchronous triggers. Um, so we need to, to be able to manage them, hmm? to learn how to manage them. Um, so this is the, the normal way, you know, you, in a browser or in a server, uh, everything is asynchronous. Uh, the request for a web page arrives when you don't expect it, uh, and the user clicks on a button when you don't expect it. So 99% of the, of the behavior of a, web, of a web application is asynchronous, happens when it needs to happen, depending on the user actions, or depending on the speed of the server returning the data or whatever happens in the environment around you. So the programming style should be mainly um, asynchronous. Hmm? Um, uh, just to answer to the, the, your question here, it's a very, but we, we want to use timeouts very much, so I didn't uh, spend too much time. This task here is a value that we, we passed there. So if we want to the timeout to remember why it was set, I can send uh, um, some additional um, value object uh, for it to, to process. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, the timeout it will be blind. OK, why, why does it happen mm -hmm. if you want to provide data? But um, it's not, it's not uh, we'll see other more, more useful ways of asynchronous calls that, that ju than just uh, callbacks. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, every operation that needs to interact with the user or interact with in, in, uh, in uh, with input output operations uh, will need to be uh, handled asynchronously because we cannot allow blocking the main program while we are waiting for an input, for example, from a keyboard or for loading a file or for completing a web request. Uh, uh, we cannot block the whole application. So all of these uh, uh, actions will be uh, asynchronous and all the library functions will be asynchronous hmm, in the um, in style. Um, okay, uh, the, the simplest one, as I mentioned, are, are timers, but I won't spend uh, uh, too much time on timers because we want, I want to go on to more useful stuff. Uh, um, Basically, there are two types of timers that can generate callbacks, asynchronous callbacks. One is the timeout and the other is the, the interval. The difference is that a timeout calls the function once and the other calls the functions many times uh, peri periodically. So every 12 seconds do something if you want to have uh, you know, uh, something that will check back uh, 
um, periodically uh, with a given period of time. But uh, okay. Um, Error handling is also a problem. It's mainly a problem, uh, well, because for two reasons. The first reason is that uh, uh, it's already difficult to handle your errors while are while, while they are happening. So if you're writing some code, then you write an expression. Then if uh, I have some error, then do something. Otherwise, continue. And then if there is some error and so on, or with the to throw exceptions, but you need to check every line where something happens. But here, you still have the control over what happens. In an asynchronous code, you know that you are setting a callback, an asynchronous callback, a synchronous callback, that will run later. And at this point, uh, it generates an error here. OK? Who is going to manage this error? My code already is in a totally different part of the program when this code executes. And so it's there's not a, you know, an, an easy way of okay, saying, okay, but remember when you, do you remember when you set up that callback? There, well, there was a problem with that. So it's a, a problem because the, the error will happen when your main program is doing something completely different. And second, uh, so this function will should have the capability of managing this error by itself it cannot rely on a main program and second because there is no standard way of doing that uh, in javascript there will be we'll see one way with promises uh, at the end of the chapter and so for example we have a read file method which is in the standard library for reading a file so if you're reading a file from from the hard disk uh, let's have a look uh, at how it works. We are not going to use it, but just to, for understanding the, the mechanism, the mental model. I want to read a file. So I provide a file name. And if you were in, in, a, uh, in a sequential programming language, then you would wait until the read has completed. Say, okay, string equal to file.read. And I wait until the file is read and the data is stored into the string not in javascript in javascript I, you tell the function okay i want to read this file when the file is read call this function i will go uh, go uh, ahead and do something else so i'm just setting the comment here i want to read this file and then i go and do something else in the next lines and so on of the program the file read operation is started right here and will take time to complete. When the file operation will be completed, this code here in the callback will be executed. And in this specific case of the read file, the callback is a function that is expected to have two parameters. One is an error indication and the other is the data being read, the string of the file contents. Uh, if the error is not null, then we mean, I mean that we have an error. If the error is null, then everything went right. So the function itself will be called when the operation is completed or when the operation caused an error of some, of some type. And the first variable here will tell me what happened. Everything is okay or there is some error. If there is no error, I can use the data. In this case, yes, with this with this pattern, the callback should be prepared for being called when the operation is completed or when the operation is aborted and behave accordingly. Uh, data inside the callback function contains the content of the file. Just be aware that data here, A equal to data, if I write something here, down here, it's a big mistake because data is not defined outside this function. It doesn't exist. 
I cannot use the content of the file in the lines after the read file. I have the read file in line 10, so in line, in line 11, I will have the data. No, no. Line 11 will be executed when the file is just being started, when, when the file read operation is just being started. So I don't have the data yet. And even if you do something like, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, result equal to data, and result is a local variable, let result equal to empty string, for example. Okay. You could not expect to use result here in, in the lines after the call because the variable result exists because I defined it here. But the value is still what I had here, the empty string. The result will be populated with a copy of data when, later on, when the time comes. I don't know when. At a given time, the value of this variable will change. Not in the next line, not in the next 20 lines, not in the last 200 lines. I don't know when, sooner or later. So I cannot rely, reliably know when a value is valid except from inside the callback. Here is the only place where I know the operation has been completed because this callback has been called for that specific purpose. So it's a bit difficult for us. And okay, I read this and then when I have the result, I do something. Okay, when I have the results means inside the callback. Uh, if the callback generates an error, uh, <laughs> it will be interrupted. The function will be interrupted or will in some cases, it will crash the program. In some cases, it will only crash the function. The problem is not generating the error. It's problem if, if you want to manage the error. So what you can do. Hmm? Uh, yes, you should be double careful with try and um, try and catch blocks uh, to manage all the errors inside the inside the, the callback. There's one more reason to make callbacks small and quick. Okay, because they are being executed in a very uh, uncomfortable environment. Uh, error and data in the callback are fixed for all the reading file operations. No, uh, the callback function is called after the file has been read. So the operating system will read all the bytes, the JavaScript library will put together a string, and at this point, they will call the function. It's not being called in progress. So you cannot see the data increase byte by byte. You will get called only when the file operation is complete with this method in particular. Okay, so they are, they are constant because the operation is finished, if I understood the question. Um, Anna, so we need to use the result of the file. We need to create a new asynchronous function. Yes, the devil, the devil is here. Okay, the only way to use the result is to, at this point, call another callback that will process the result. So I have one callback called by read file that gets the result. And if the result is okay, I will call another callback that asynchronously will do something with the result of the file. So we are just hopping like frogs from callback to callback to callback, everything asynchronous. And the main thread will do nothing basically because it can do anything because it doesn't have the data yet. Um, error checking and collecting data always for reading files. So, um, so the file read method has these two parameters. The problem is that, uh, as, like, like we said, uh, there is no standard. So this function read file works in this way. So they will give you these two variables. Other functions may work in different ways. So we need to check the documentation for every function, how they provide you the data, how to check the how do they, they they tell you that there was some error okay uh, to show you something asynchronous that makes uh, some sense uh, which is not just timers or reading files that's something that we are go never going to use uh, we decided to show you something uh, that we are really going to use uh, like accessing databases 
So of course, in our in any web application, we will have a database in the server, and the access to the database is of course an asynchronous operation. Uh, there are many different types of databases. Here we are using the simplest one, which is uh, uh, SQLite. I don't know if you are familiar with that. Probably you are familiar with uh, I don't know MySQL or Oracle or other databases, which are real client server solutions. So there's a server which uh, is the database management system and your client application will just connect uh, to send queries and get results. This is the normal client server model for accessing data in a database. Mm -hmm. We decided not to use this model, which is the real one, okay, in this course, uh, not to add more, to avoid adding more complexity um, and to avoid having to set up also a database server and so on in our application. It's already uh, complex enough. So we are using SQLite. SQLite is an embedded database. So we have our application that runs in Node, JS, and uh, uh, we have a one file that contains the database. And the file is uh, managed directly by our program. And basically, SQLite is a small C library that is able to understand a small dialect of SQL and uh, do the operations immediately on a file. So it's an embedded database that uh, saves all the data into one binary file. And this, there's no server. Okay, there's not just the client that is able to manipulate directly the file. So we don't need to install any other servers to connection to, to pa with passwords, with ports uh, and open firewalls and so on. So it's a very simple, but the idea is the same. Okay, it's much simpler to use because there's just a file that you can copy in your project and open the file to connect to the database. The, na the native uh, SQLite library is a C library that has been embedded, of course, in a, in a JavaScript package. And there are also libraries for every programming language in the world. Um, we are using it. We will be using HTTP requests, of course, when we have the browser. Okay. So right now we are we have a process that we use the data. This data will be exposed to the browser, and the browser will do HTTP requests to our code that will then read the database. So we are still one step back. We, are we only have one one process right now. Okay, not not we are not yet in the web. Okay, so how does it work? Um, we can use the SQLite three. Sorry, it's not SQLite but SQLite three the um, module to uh, access the database. And this also gives us a parenthesis to show how uh, the module system in, in Node is working. Uh, right now, we up to now, we just use the JavaScript standard library. Now we want to import another module, which is outside you now the standard library. So how can we do that? So let's go to this. Uh, Okay, uh, this one with courses is okay. Is there even this project? Hmm? Exercise week two. I created a, a folder so that I will share all the files with you and all, everything that we did in this week will be in this project, in this folder. <coughs> Sorry. So we want to uh, create uh, programs that can use uh, external modules. For doing that, uh, we can use the app npm command. Uh, which is the node module manager that can install new modules and so on. Every uh, project has a specific file called uh, package.json, package.json, that contains some information. And the, among this information, there is the list of the modules that are part of this project. And we can add new modules using a command called npm install. So the command that should, we should give is, but we don't give it yet, uh, SQLite 3. Okay, so this will add to our packet.json the dependency of this project, this folder from this library. The problem is that right now the uh, packet.json file, it doesn't exist yet. So we first have to create this file. So we have uh, um, npm init. The init command 
creates uh, the package.json file. Uh, it asks me some questions. Uh, feel free to just enter the name of the project, uh, the version, a description, the initial file. Uh, we can change it when you want. The test command, git repository, keywords, author, whatever you want. So just some defaults. Is it okay? Yes, I don't know. I didn't read it. But it created the packet.json file. Okay, packet.json contains some information. We can change them if you want. Now we can use npm to add dependencies to our problems, to our project install SQLite 3. The first common was npm init. NPM in it. Uh, the second is so we need to do that the init once per project. Okay. Once it's initialized, we, we have created this file. It's just for creating this file. Then we install the uh, the dependency. There are basically three options to install a dependency. One is uh, the default one, npm install. It will add the dependency to this project. And so every time you want to replicate this project, you need to have this dependency available installed. The second is minus G, that means global. It will install this dependency on your operating system, not in the folder, not in the project, on your computer. So that it's available for all the projects. Um, I won't do it. Uh, it's not recommended to do it uh, because then every project uh, will use some libraries that may or may not be installed in your system. The global installation is only for stuff that you really want to use outside your project. Every project should have should list its own dependencies. There's also a third option which is called development. I think it's called uh, written like this that. Uh, um, remembers that this dependency is only for development purposes and is not needed in the final version, in the production version of the program. So we'll save the dependency in a different place. And when you're packaging the final application, it will be skipped because it's not used in runtime, but also all only in development. Okay, but you can check all the details in the NPM documentation. NPM install SQLite, it will download the library and all the dependency of these libraries. And it will create a folder, a subfolder called node modules inside your project. And in the modules, it's, it grows very. So we installed SQLite 3 is here. And but SQLite 3 needed a lot of other you know, uh, transitive dependencies, and so it downloaded all of them. So it's uh, this folder, not modules, grows much bigger than your normal project. Hmm? Uh, but okay, it contains all the dependencies. It also creates a file called package lock that lists the actual versions of all the packages that are in node modules. If you need to uh, replicate the exact version numbers, these are the numbers that you have, where it downloaded and the hash type it and so on. Usually you don't care. By the way, if we happen to lose everything, so let's uh, in, suppose you, we, we delete uh, the package uh, recurs recursively, not modules and uh, package lock. Okay, we only have the package.json. We can recreate everything just with npm install. And we'll check the content of package.json and download and install everything you need. So usually when you distribute a project, you only distribute the package.json and maybe the package lock if you want to lock some specific versions, but normally the package.json and then the person that received the project create does a, an npm install and everything will be recreated on their computer okay so right now we have the um, 
SQLite module. And we can use uh, the SQLite library in our programs. I uh, no, I didn't use the dev, dev options because the SQLite will be used for running the program, not just for development. The dev is for you know code checkers, linters, debuggers, and so on stuff that is not is not part of the program or it's part of the tool set. Hmm? Um, so I just installed that uh, normally. So without any specific options. Okay, uh, how do you do that? Uh, we use for using a library in uh, in Node use the require function. The require function is so let's uh, op create a new file called uh, uh, I don't know um, numbers.js. Okay, and we I want to use a database with this file so use strict and then uh, const sqlite require sqlite 3 okay it's correct uh, yeah um, require okay what happens here is that uh, uh, we are importing into our program the content of this package, of this module. We will explain modules later on, but for doing that, uh, we don't need it. And we have a reference, a variable that references the content that is being exported by that module. Then we need to, uh, OK, this is just import the module, the library. Then we need to connect to that to have a database and to connect to that database. So for creating a database, we could do that with SQL statements uh, or with some programs. For example, I have uh, one program which is called the uh, SQLite Studio, but there are three or four. There's also a um, VS Code extension for doing that. But uh, we can create uh, uh, a new database. We create it into a file uh numbers let's say okay and uh, i save it sorry i need to save it somewhere uh let me save it here in a temporary directory uh, um, uh numbers numbers dot sqlite i call it dot sqlite it's not uh, mandatory but just for remembering and so I can inside this database. Sorry, it's small, but I can, you know how I, uh, I, if it can be made big, bigger. But I just create a table. Uh, let's say number. And the table will have uh, one. Uh, okay. Enter. What is that? The columns uh, where that sorry, and the table constraints uh, and columns, yeah. And the name is uh, number, number of data type. Uh, a, a table, uh, I, I'm trying to do something very simple a table that contains just numbers, okay? Uh, the simplest database, one database called numbers that contains one table called numbers that contain one column called num. Mm -hmm. And they can sa save it. It will execute this statement uh, and will create uh, the file. Maybe I can enter some data also if I want. So in this table, I can uh, edit in the table, change the values, sorry. But I can't browse. What is that? Sorry. Mm. Data. Sorry. Yeah, data. I can add some numbers, maybe 18 or uh, 5 and uh, 300, for example. OK. And then I can commit this data into the database. So I'm creating a database that 
very simply, is all contained into a single file. So when, I, when it's committed, I just have one file in my computer uh, with this structure, okay? I can copy this file into this project because I, I had it in a, into a temporary folder. Okay, I have it here, number.sqlite. I copy it here, not in node modules, sorry. Stop, okay. Here. Okay, so I have simply a file in my project. There is, uh, if you want, there's an extension of uh, VS Code that, uh, sorry, it's here. It will uh, let you open the database. It's called SQLite Explorer, where you can see the table, the number, and the values that I just inserted into the table. Okay, so it's a, it's a way of easy uh, uh, browsing of the file. But so it takes some time, of course, with every database, you need to design it, to create it and so on. But at the end, it's just everything in a single file, just copy it into your project. Then how can I, I, can, how can I access that? I can do that by opening a database using the SQLite.database call. Sorry, it's a constructor function, if I remember correctly new 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 <laughs> with the e and with the name of the file numbers dot sqlite so this is the call sorry let me pick the slides for connecting to the database new sqlite dot database and the name of the database in a normal language it would be all and this uh, instruction would just create the database and let me use it uh, in the next lines. Okay, it will be a synchronous call. In JavaScript, of course, it's it's asynchronous, and so it will uh, succeed or it will generate an error. So I must provide a callback that will handle the error if that happens. So I need to provide a callback that takes the error and does something like, for example, just throw an exception. If error, throw error. So that I will transform the asynchronous error indication into an exception generated by the program. So we interrupt the program, the program unless I'm catching this exception somewhere else. OK. <coughs> Sorry. And now, how can I use the database but of course at the end i should remember to close it okay good let's write it db.close so what i did is uh, i have a variable that refers to the module that i imported through this variable i access a function that is called database that is a creator function that takes the name the name of a file and returns me a reference to the database through this db variable, I do all the operations on this database. So I, it's a sort of a connection variable, okay? So how can I do a query to this database? Well, there are different methods. The easiest one is uh, the all method on this db object. The all method executes a query and that I write as a string and as a normal string, and then receives a callback function with two parameters, the error, possible error, and the rows of the result, encoded as an array, an array with all the rows in the results of the query. And so inside this callback there, I can use the result. Okay, so for example, I want to print these three numbers. Okay, so my query would be so db.all, all because I want all the results. The first parameter is the SQL string. Okay, select everything from uh, numbers. Now, 
numbers. Okay. The second parameter is uh, a callback function with two arguments. So the, the arguments are error and the rows. And let's say what let's see what we do with these parameters. Okay. Uh, so we have uh, this db all function call that starts here and ends there. And inside we have the arrow function that starts here and ends there. So we have this start with strong sequence of closing parentheses that is common in JavaScript. Right now here we are inside the callback that will be called when the query is over. And so here I could, for example, write console. So every, oh, so first of all, I need to check if you have an error, then throw the error. And if we don't have any error, so we can continue, continue. Uh, if we else. Otherwise we can, for example, just uh, uh, print all the elements in the rows. Rows, uh, it's, an, uh, it's a list of objects. Every row in the database is one item in the list and every row has many properties corresponding to the columns. So if I iterate for each row of the list of rows, For each row, I can print, for example, console.log uh, what row dot number. The row is an object that has many properties corresponding to the columns from the query. And the columns, remember, there's only one column which is called none. Okay. So we can print the, the numbers and then we can print uh, done after the execution of all the query. Um, Carlo, I think you mean here, I'm opening the file here. So I need the, I copy the, the file into the project directory. I just copied that. And then when I open the database, I have to specify the name of the file to which this DB variable is attached. Hmm. Uh, can you use for each? Yes, because it's an array. Uh, rows is a normal array. So if you want to use for each, you can use for each. The table name is without the S. Uh, yes, you are right. Thank you for the debugging. Yes, we just copied the file. That's we. That's easy. Hmm? Uh, row may need let. Yes. I want you always with me when I program. Uh, you are, you are saving me a lot of time by finding my bugs. Um, okay. So let's write. Let's run it maybe in the, in the terminal, so we are sure what uh, we are doing. Node uh, numbers, JS. Okay, so it's run. And as Jacopo says, uh, we have um, a problem with the done, uh, with the done message, because it's been printed before the numbers. Okay, in this case. So what happens here is that you see done and then the numbers. What is happening? Okay, I execute instruction in line eight. Then I will go to line 18 and I will execute this. So line 18 is executed immediately after eight. But in eight, I started a parallel process of querying the database that sooner or later will finish and will execute these instructions. I don't know whether this process of executing the query will be faster or slower than line 18 that will print done. 
So it may happen that then that done will be printed before the numbers because the query is slower, which is a normal case here. Uh, or it may also happen that done is printed at the end because maybe the query is faster or I'm doing something more complex here in line 17 that make me lose time. Um, because JavaScript is single threaded, uh, done cannot happen in the middle of the numbers because when I'm executing this code, I'm in this function and then until I finish this function, I will not leave it. Okay, so uh, it's not possible to have uh, one iteration of this four and then done and then the second iteration of this four, not in JavaScript, right? So it's either before or after the execution of a function is, is always complete, but you don't know the order. Um, that can happen that db.all gives error if the previous instruction finishes after we start calling db.all. Let me read the question again. Does it can db.all gives error if the previous instruction finishes after we start, start calling db.all? Sorry, I don't get it. db.all will start the, the query. The database will work and uh, this callback will be called, okay? With an error or with, or with a result, depends. Okay, if there was an error, but the error only depends on the execution of this query, it cannot depend on something else. Okay, it's going on on its own. Nothing of what we do later can affect uh, usually the execution, the execution of this query, okay? then this callback is called independently from the code. Hmm. Um, if the SQLite does not return right away, can you generate an error? No, sorry, other, so may, maybe I understood what you say. DB is just a reference that has all the information to connect to the database. Then when we call db.all, we are starting at an asynchronous operation. Then we can also use, ah, okay. So if, if, you, if you have some error here, you mean? Uh, this throw will, will interrupt the program. So we'll, uh, this exception is not caught. And so the, the, the execution of the program will, will, will be terminated. If I change the number or the name of the file here, okay, I will not proceed. I get the SQLite error and the program will stop here in line five. Okay. Um, so, okay. Oh, um, the other question is if there is no error, the, this database function is strange because it calls the callback only in case of error. And in the normal case is a synchronous operation. So DB is already defined here. We don't know really, we don't know whether database is a synchronous uh, function or if uh, the all will wait internally until DB is, uh, is okay. But for our point of view, we can assume that after this uh, uh, database call, uh, the DB variable is already uh, valid, okay? We don't have to wait it for being okay. And, and now, so uh, there are good. They work good questions now. Understand them, okay? DB, you can you can think of this as a, as a synchronous call with an asynchronous error message. It's strange, yes, but I'm not a designer of that library. Hmm? Um, okay, uh, Marco, this is not uh, the only way of. Uh, working with the results. So this is one way, is the easiest one. Uh, so let me read all the questions so they can answer. Uh, which, uh, I mean, Colin is wrong. Can we force the b.all to print first before the other line? No, uh, but it depends on what, on what we need to do, okay? Um, what we can do if we want it done at the end is to put it here. 
or if you want to process the data in some other program, you can call a second callback to process the data. So maybe you have a function process my data rows, and I don't know what what it does. Okay, and here. I can say uh, inside after logging, I can just uh, call this function. Hmm? And this function will be called when the value is available. Hmm? I can call it right now, and I can also wrap all, every, all of this into one function that uses, that receives this process by data, sorry, as a callback name. We can wrap it into, into some other call. Um, so about the methods for doing queries, db.all is the simplest one. It returns all the data. You can also have db.get that will only give you the first row. If you know that the result is only one row, for example, you're making a count, for example. So there's only one row or each that will return you one row at a time. What does it mean? It means that the callback receives only one row and the callback is called many times, one per every row. So if you have many, many rows, you, instead of waiting for all of them to arrive, as soon as one row of the result arrives, you are um, your callback is executed. And then the second one arrives and the second one uh, is received and so on. So if we need to process them on the fly, you can use this each method uh with the same query or if you want if you had to store all the results uh in any case maybe all it's easier okay and then there's a run method for executing other kinds of queries that don't return a result okay all these three uh all each and get assume that you are making a select and so you have a table of results to return any other type of query, for example, an insert or an, or an update, uh, doesn't return um, some data, some results, and so it should be called with run. And you see that the callback is only used for error handling. And so there's no way of uh, getting some data because you are inserting or updating or creating something. Okay. Uh, we are Carlo, we are not using uh, the um, ORM uh, uh, object relation uh, libraries or something like that. For, the, for our purposes, it would be uh, enough to just write queries in SQL. But if you want uh, to explore and use a library, you are free to do that. We are not adding that as a topic of the course. Um, then, then, oh, uh, Luca, yes, the parameters attribute I didn't mention was for. Uh, queries containing parameters. That's my next slide. So if you have one query that contains some parametric values, never just inject them into the SQL, uh, into the string, because it will create a lot of uh, SQL injection problems. And you, you have a placeholder. So in your query string, you put placeholders where the variable values will go. And then uh, you have a second parameter. So the first one is always the query. The last one is always the callback. In the middle, you have an extra parameter, which is an array of the values that will be substituted for all the question marks in the query. So just for parameter queries, uh, if you want to search for a specific value, you put the question mark and then you put the value here. Just remember that even if you have only one question mark, you need uh, an array so that the code understand that this is an array, not a callback. Hmm? um okay uh there are these are not yet prepared statement basically mm, this the sql i3 library is so simple it doesn't need to prepare statement they are just strings it doesn't prepare really the statement it's only parametric statements in the um their meaning uh so but i know what you, uh, what you mean in the in the, um, jdbc they will be called prepared statements Lorenzo, uh, db.each could be used for this display results as they come and not making the user wait for the whole query. Yes, yes. Or if you don't, yes, if you don't, if you have only some computation to do or to use one value at a time, of course, 
if you have an application when the time between the different results uh, is significant, uh, probably you have some problems, okay? If the user feels the weight between row and row results, uh, it's uh, probably not a, a good application. Uh, but uh, in general, yes, if you want to process some data and then go to the next data, you don't need to have all of them together. After you process the first one, you throw it away. It's basically some internal uh, memory saving. Not much time, but memory. If, if you have a, a huge number of data with all, you need to store all of them and then process them. With each, uh, you need to store only one of them at a time. So your application will use less memory in the computer. Um, okay. So, okay, with the, some examples about of the of the ex exercise with the exams and with the database, uh, but of course we don't. Uh, we have some some examples of uh, of queries uh, here in the slide that use the db dot all, but it's the same that, as we did uh, um, interactively together. This is a bit more complex because. Uh, uh, it's uh, it, the, the tables are more complex and the query I have the left join the query but nothing special um, let's spend one minute in or two at looking at this code hmm? this code is just a version of this one in this code I had a query that prints uh, the results I don't want to print the results. I want to save them for later. Okay. So what do I do? I create an array. And while I'm processing the results, I'm copying the rows into this array, into the result array. And so I imagine I could be able of using the results later on. Of course, this doesn't work. We already saw that with our done, okay, print. Because these lines at the end will really be executed before the query. And so I will be printing the asterisks and an empty result. So it looks like they are executed later because they are below, but it doesn't apply here, okay? The notion of before and after is no longer the notion of above or below. But it's very difficult, okay, to, to get in our mind. If we have a set, a set of queries, we are tempted to say this query and then this one and so on. I, I made this a very simple example here. Um, for example, in our numbers example, okay, I created this table. And then imagine I'm doing a very stupid thing. In, I insert a number and then I count how many numbers I have. And I repeat this in a loop. So insert a number, count, okay, now I have two numbers. I insert another one, I count, so I will have three. I insert another one, I count, and now I have four. So this is a very complex program just to, to print the sequence of numbers, right? Except, uh, so this was the implementation of this program. It's identical to the one. I have a run of the, uh, of the insert instruction. Okay, I use a run because you have an insert and not a select. And then I have a select. This is to be all, but it being uh, get would be enough because I only have one row, just the count. And when I get the count, I show the number, the first number. I will share you with you the files if you if you want to try them. Okay. And this is it is an example of the output of this code. 89, 90, 91, 92. Okay, good. 96. 96, 96. What, what happens here? Huh? The numbers are increasing but they are not sequential they're not consecutive we are skipping some numbers hmm? 89 99 99 99 again 400 400 again 
So this is a symptom that something asynchronous is happening. If I have a, a red rectangle for the first insert query, in a loop, I'm calling many of these queries. Of course, the second one will start after the first one starts. But I'm not sure whether the second one will end, it will start before, after, sorry, the first one is finished. So it may be also some overlapping between the red queries in different iterations of the for loop. And the, the orange one, which is the select, also will start, the select will start after the start of the insert. But most likely, when it will start before the insert is finished. So we'll take a different snapshot of the database. And so on. So they, they are over. There's a partial ordering, basically, of the execution of the different queries. And so sometimes uh, it may happen that the inserts are faster, and so we're skipping from 92 to 96. And then sometimes it may happen that the selects are faster, and so we have uh, many results uh, over the same total number of elements. Fortunately, the database protects itself, so the queries are atomic, so we don't create <laughs> damage into the database, but the results that we see are randomly. Hmm? Um, so how to resolve this problem? The solution is in the line of what Lorenzo is saying, but is more complex than that. The idea is that I should run the uh, you're saying I should run the db.all inside the callback of the db.run. Great. But I should run, but it's not enough because I would have solved the, 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 the order of this one and this one. But I would still overlap between the first and the second iteration because if I put this code here, I'm sure that the second query will only run after the first insert. But just remember that the second iteration is quicker. So I'm starting a second insert before the first insert is completed and before the first select is executed. I will still have problems like this. The second iteration will start before the first iteration is completed. So I should also put the insert in the execution code of the select. So the select should be, the debit all should be here and the run should be there. And of course it's not possible. <laughs> it's not possible to have the, uh, at the same time, the orange block inside the callback of the red block and the red block inside the callback of the orange block. Uh, it's very co complex, okay? To have all of this to ensure that we have a sequence of queries that are executed in a given order okay this problem is artificial because i have all of them in a loop normally i don't do the, these things in a loop but and so the solution that we have been discussing is applied i have one query in the callback of the first query i run the second query in the callback of the second query i run the third query and so on and so on and so you have nested callback one inside the other inside the other inside the other so when i wanted what I, when i really wanted to do is a sequence a synchronous sequence of queries what i actually get is a nested sequence of asynchronous callbacks but i must be construct them carefully otherwise i get wrong results if i have a finite a finite number of queries to to, to do if I have a large number, like in a loop, uh, of course I can do that. Hmm? Uh, I created a solution here. If, I, if, if you want, I can share the file that was based on a state machine, basically. Okay, in every state, uh, I have a transition, I send a query, and then in the callback, I will trigger the next, uh, but it's not a code that I would like to, to, to use or to share or to suggest. Okay, so it was just a demonstration for me that it could work, but it's not uh, my suggestion solu suggested solutions. This suggested solution is a suspense for next uh, Thursday, the promises, okay? So all this asynchronous code, we can do whatever we want uh, with this asynchronous code, not with the loop, of course, but in normal program. This one, it was a, was a 
with a bad program, with a bad example, okay? I try to stress the system to show the problems. But normally you can write code like this uh, and uh, it works. Hmm? Uh, when the problem happens, when we have uh, too many callbacks to chain, it becomes very complex to manage, to handle and, uh, and, to, and to understand. And so there is a recent uh, addition to the language of JavaScript uh, called promises that will simplify a lot of our code. That will uh, allow us to use asynchronous code, uh, but in a way call them in a synchronous way. I'm sorry that you have to wait until Thursday to discover how can all this can be made simpler by using promises. Okay. And, um, and we'll also discuss that not all the libraries adopt uh, or use this new promises standard. And so we have to learn both uh, the new way with promises and await instructions and the old way with asynchronous callbacks that we also need to be able to manage. Okay, but uh, for today, that's all for real. And so I will uh, publish uh, these uh, examples that we did together. I will publish them on, on GitHub. So if you, if, you, if you want to check what I wrote uh, uh, or tell me more errors that I did uh, along the way, uh, you will have the code and also the examples that are linked here with the slides uh, so that you can uh, have a better idea. It, we are I'm aware we are putting layer on top of layer on top of layers uh, to, to, um, to, to manage a language which, is, which, which has a high complexity, okay? Uh, after that, when we start writing application, it will all come together much easier. We understand the basic mechanism, but then we will have some patterns of programming which are more or less the same. And so it will be less uh, uh, head aging uh, uh, as a programming. Okay, so, but that's all for now. And thank you and see you on Thursday morning. Bye-bye.